Welcome back to the Life on Books podcast. My name is Tony. With me as always is Andy, a.k.a. Metafictional Meathead. What's up? Morning. And we've been doing a discussion on what we're currently reading at the start of every episode, but today we're going to do a Q&A. For anyone who has been enjoying the reading updates, I just finished The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck and was um, a little underwhelmed by it, unfortunately. And uh, I've also been picking my way through You Bright and Risen Angels by William T. Volman, which mm. I think my interest in that is probably what pulled me away from uh, the Steinbeck. I think yeah, there's obviously just a huge difference in styles, and I think that kind of exuberance and electricity that Volman was bringing is really kind of more of my vibe. I think my tastes have changed a lot since I finished mm. East of Eden uh, the, for the last time. Um, Keep going. And uh, I've just been really into the Volman. I kind of, for the longest time, have been a fringe fan of his. I, what do you mean by I've i enjoyed, um, I've read The Rainbow Stories, The Atlas, and Horse for Gloria. And I think he's one of those authors that, by, by fringe fan, I think, you know, he's, he's one of those authors that um, – I almost like the idea of more than I like the author and his work. He's someone I've always really wanted to like and get into. Um, and save for a few stories in both collections, the rainbow stories and the Atlas. Um, I never like was quite getting hooked. I, I could see the the potential there, but it was yeah. never like really clicking. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, there's a couple <clears throat> short stories in the the rainbow stories that were really good um the blue yonder which was one of his like novellas that was in there was really good um but this is my first experience with his like longer form fiction sure and it's it's actually his debut novel um but it is really turning me into quite the believer quite the <laughs> uh volmaniac volmaniac yeah he's a prolific author i have a few of his books which i've never read which might seem strange, but he's just one of those authors that you feel like you probably should read. And so when I do come across his work, I will grab it uh, just to have it because you just never know when the mood's going to strike you to pick it up off the shelf and read it. Um, Also, today's episode is not sponsored by Monster Energy Drink, but it would be fantastic if it were (laughs) uh, because that would save me some dollars if I got some free monsters. All right. so Yeah, I think I've said this before um, to someone on Instagram recently. I think the interesting thing about Volman is because he's so prolific and because the volume of his work doesn't, he doesn't necessarily stand, tend to stay in one lane. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there's a little bit of something for everybody to try. You know, if you don't, if you give like Bright and Risen Angels a, a, a try and you're not really into it, there's, he's there, got his, yeah. his nonfiction work. He's got the Seven Dreams series. Um, He's got Europe Central, which is like um, I heard on a, a podcast about him. They described it as basically like Volman for your dad. Like it's nice. Volman writes World War Two, a World War Two novel. Love so it. it's, it's you know, yeah. I just your dad. Just kind of flipping through some of the books that I have and other books I've seen of his in the stores. Uh, there does seem to be a pretty wide scope of topics, uh, so that's good. Um, okay. I let's get into these questions. Let's get into these questions. So the first question comes from the bookish mank on Instagram. Uh, I believe that's how it's pronounced. Yeah, it's uh, uh it's uh Dave. He runs the um he has a podcast Chatting Lit Chatting podcast. Lit Podcast. Give that a listen if you don't already. And uh he asks, How did you guys meet? Uh so I guess technically friends of friends. Yeah. This was in another life when we were both in the uh, fitness industry. And yeah. I I had been training in the sport of um, Olympic weightlifting, which sounds a lot cooler than it actually is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had been getting coaching from some friends of mine, and they um, decided it was time to get serious with their real jobs. So they hung up their stopwatches, and um, I was looking where to go next, and one of them recommended – I reach out to you. Did That's some, right. I did coach you first. Yeah. Yeah. We did some kind of remote work where Tony was sending me stuff. Because uh, you were still the, living on the cave. Yeah, via the internet. And then um, I was studying exercise science. Needed to do an internship. I 
was lucky enough to do that at Tony's gym. That turned into a full-time job, which was great. And now we um, are out of the fitness industry and we just talk about books. Yeah, I uh, had the audacity to sell my business, left Andy behind, uh, and then he quit shortly thereafter. Um, So we've known each other for... Five years, Going six on years, five or six. Yeah. yeah, it's been a good, uh, a good relationship all around. Um, Hunter Haddock asks, "What are some things, uh, some of the things you look for when selecting a book?" Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is like a book off my own bookshelf or if he's meaning in the store. I'm gonna assume in the store. I mean, we can do both. So yeah. Why don't you start with in the store? What do you kind of look for? That's, there's a lot of possibilities. Um, it depends <laughs> what store we're at. Um, I think anytime I wind up at a used bookstore, I really love um, uh, doggy archive books. Mm-hmm. Even if I, I have not read anywhere near as uh, much as I think I have, um, or it might seem um, given the breadth of my collection, but you know, their publications have a very distinct um, logo. So, and they, Publish some weird, cool avant-garde type stuff. Um, so I always look for those. I I, I kind of look for like if, if I was saying this to you and um, we were going down to Gray Matter last weekend. If I don't really have anything in mind, like certain books or authors I'm looking for, I will tend to look out for publishers mm-hmm. that I know publish things in this in the um, kind of vein of books that I like. Mm-hmm. You know, or I, I've read a lot of books that have been published by. Um, Doggy Archive or, or New Directions or the New, um, New York Review of Books. So like I see those and I kind of know like, okay, these guys put out some good books and, you know, I might pull it off the shelf and it might not be something, seem like something that I'm interested in, but um, that's kind of where I start if I, if I don't really go in with a clear objective. Um I can't say that I really have any like specifics of things that I look out for. Like, mm. cause I, I, I know I tend to read books that are all very similar, but I think sometimes I think when I go out and look, like I, I try to be a little bit more open in general. Um, cause you know, I don't always just look for books that are funny or, Books that are sad or right. that are about a certain you're not a genre su- reader necessarily, right. and I don't um, particularly stick to books like from the same time period or subject. You know, I have a kind of historical epic of um, um, years that books were written that I like books out of that, but it's not like I only like to read books about World War Two sure. or books about war in general or things like that. Um, and then honestly, sometimes I just look for titles that seem weird and interesting or, um, covers that look cool to me. You know, I, I know I have trashed like people on Instagram that are grab their book and they're like, look how pretty this cover is. Sure. Like, but sometimes like, like we'll talk about same bed, different dreams, but this cover is really cool. Like yeah. if I saw this in a bookstore, I'd be like, that looks really cool. Like, I want to know what that's about. Um, That's exactly what happened to me with the sympathizer. Yeah, the, the colors stood out. I thought the artwork on the cover was interesting. I thought the title was interesting. So I just, I had no idea what it was about. Grabbed it. Yeah, I was like, oh, this sounds like it would be kind of up my alley. So, yeah. And as far as picking books off my shelf, I think sometimes it's just like I close my eyes and point. Sure. You know. Yeah. Um. I I I try to make lists and plan of attack and things like that and. It changes though. I'll make a list. Yeah. Here's the next ten. Right. And then I get two books deep into it, and I'm way off course. My my thing, my setup is like I have my my library in my house, and I have my chair in the corner, and it just faces all my shelves. Mm. So I I like to be able to look up and um see all my <laughs> books while I'm reading. I've very much romanticized the act of reading. Um, Same, but. You know, I'll get distracted by something on the shelf or while I'm reading whatever book I'm currently in, it'll kind of make me think of something else or I'll see somebody post on Instagram or something will just come up where I start to think about this other book. 
Um, and it'll just totally throw a wrench in my plans. And I think that's another reason why I can't stick with just one book at a time. Yeah. You know, we've, um, it, it's something I've talked about before, like how I like to read multiple books at, at one time. And I try to keep it to like, you know, no more than three yeah. at a time. Cause after that, I think I start to really go off the rails and like, it's hard at that point, it becomes hard to keep track of things, mm -hmm. what's going on within each book. But like, you know, I, I was really invested in the grapes of wrath. And then we went to, um, that bookstore and I found that copy of you bright and risen angels, yeah. which I actually already had a copy, but I think that excitement of seeing it in the store, uh, it's, he's, an author that I have seen in stores before, um, and despite how prolific he is, I feel like I always see the same like yeah, two to it's three the same couple titles. You know, Absolutely. I've seen Fathers and Crows everywhere. Yeah, um, and, and it's not a lot of you don't see a lot of his books everywhere. Yeah, so I think that excitement just kind of took me over, and I was like, I'm going to read this right now. And yeah, and you finished that first, or uh, you start? You no, you you haven't finished it yet, have you? Correct. Okay, correct. And I think that's kind of why I, I did a little bit of binging with the Grapes of Wrath um, yesterday. It was because I was like, I got gotcha. I'm into it and in deep enough and enjoying it enough that I'm not just gonna like close it and say it's not for me. I want to finish. I wanted to finish it, but I also wanted to put it to bed so that I could focus on yeah. Volman and yeah. I don't know, maybe start something. I'll probably end up starting something else, but um, I don't know. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> no, I think so. For me, it's really evolved what I look for. Um, a few years ago, I was really into just used books only. Mm -hmm. And it was a fun thing to really just like go into a used bookstore because you really don't know what you're going to find. A lot of book used bookstores are very... Uh, they're not really up to speed technologically. It's sometimes hard to even find them online, yep. what hours they're open. And they certainly, most most of them certainly don't catalog. No. Some some do. There's some stores um, like Lacey, the owner of uh, Henniker mm -hmm. Book Farm, um, who we've done some content on, a uh, fantastic used bookstore. She purchased the store uh and they had some books cataloged already, so she's adding to that. Uh, so you can go online and see some of what she has available. Same thing with Monroe Street Books. That's a great bookstore. Fantastic bookstore in Vermont. Uh, if you're ever out that way, highly recommended. They have some books online, but not all of them. But generally speaking, when you go to a, a really cool, legitimate used bookstore, they don't you don't know what's going to be in there. So it was fun to just like find really interesting books. And I, I read a bunch of books from stores like that, that I had no idea what they were about ahead of time, who the author was. One of the books I read that I gave to somebody and then never gave it back regrettably was a book from I think 1920. And as far as I could tell, it was basically like the very first self-help book. Like I, I, okay. I couldn't find anything that really you could label that like written earlier than this. Mm -hmm kind of clearly with that intent in mind. And the author of the book was unnamed. They said, I don't want who I am to influence wow. the information. So I'm just writing this book just for the benefit of society. Yeah. And it was so cool and interesting and, and f weird and funny because a lot of the things that people stress about today was pretty much the same, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, it was just like the remedies for which were much different right. and, the science obviously wasn't up to date uh, compared to now. But uh, so stuff like that was really interesting. And then I kind of realized like buying, just buying books at random is not collecting books. And so you either have to collect books to collect a certain type of book, or you should buy books to, to read all of them. Right. Even if you don't necessarily get to all of them, you should buy books with the intention to read them. Uh, so I shifted gears into, collecting um, weightlifting related books mm -hmm. and vintage fitness books uh, because fitness is really kind of like a, 
it, it's not that old of a concept. Um, you know, previously we'd get all of our physical activity from hunting and gathering, and then it would turn into farming or physical labor of some sort. So really the idea of fitness as a structured thing is only like a couple hundred years old. If that, if that, yeah. Um, and the history of fitness is really interesting. Like, uh, in the 1800s and I think Germany, they like fitness clubs were like these really huge social hubs. And so not only were people in there to physically challenge themselves and, and improve their fitness, but they were also usually like somewhat politically right. tie, tied together in some way. So it was like a, you know, fitness club for socialists or, or whatever. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. Uh, and that you can kind of still see like the remnants of that in modern day fitness. Like I know that like a lot of CrossFit gyms are very like outspoken, like conservative or whatever, you yeah. know what I mean? So you kind of still see that uh, happening. Which makes sense because you have people who are going to the same place multiple times a week seeing the same people. So it makes sense that they would build those types of relationships. Yeah. Also, um, the sport of what Andy referred to earlier as Olympic weightlifting, we just call it weightlifting. That's really what the sport's called. Um, you know, you don't call swimming Olympic swimming just because it's co contested in in the Olympics. But for, for anyone listening that wants to be pedantic and know the difference, the act of lifting weights just for general fitness is two words, weight, lifting. Correct. The sport is one word, weightlifting. With a capital W. With a capital W. <laughs> um, and so in that sport, uh, it was part of the first modern Olympics in 1896, uh, but the events that were contested changed quite a bit in those first 30 to 40 years. And now um, they there was three events up until 1972, uh, there was the snatch, the clean and jerk, and the clean and press. We don't need to get into the difference between those. <laughs> but in 1972, they removed the clean and press. They just felt it was a little too redundant with the clean and jerk, and there was some other injury concerns with that movement. Uh, so it's just been the snatch and clean and jerk since 1972, the two events that are contested. And uh, so it, it's an interesting sport. It's a, it's, a rare, it's a not very popular sport in the U.S., so finding – texts text on it in English is pretty hard to do. Uh, so I started collecting books specifically about that sport. And uh, they, I, I, I think I probably completed that collection. I think I owned literally every book written in English on that topic, aside from like people self-publishing stuff in the last maybe year or two, right. just some gym owner, coach, whatever. But there were some... Uh, really rare books that were hard to find. And so I kind of cl completed that collection. And then also because I sold the gym and was no longer involved in coaching, I was just like, okay, now what? So I right. sold off every single book yeah. and I was like, I'm just going to start anew. Uh, and so now I buy books with the intention of reading them. And I do want to get to the point where I have a really um, respectable library and, and, I don't know, either building a, a separate building on this property or if we ever move um, to have like a legit library. So I'm just, I look for, uh, you know, people that are considered like authors you, sh you must read yep, or uh, maybe one-off titles that are like must read classics. Um, just trying to be as like well-rounded and well-read as I can be. Uh, taking suggestions from Instagram, from you, from TikTok, yeah, uh, just perusing my, you know, the internet and finding stuff. So, what's uh, what's a little frustrating, and this is partly my fault, is like I I usually put my the books I want to acquire into lists on Amazon, mm -hmm. and for no other reason than Amazon has like pretty much every book cataloged, right? Um, but Amazon lists are kind of clunky and they don't really do a good job. You can't like alphabetize your list by title or author or anything like that. Um, and so I just have like basic fiction and nonfiction uh, sections, which is not good enough because a lot of like, especially with nonfiction, there's no like nonfiction section in a bookstore. Right. So, you know, I'll look at a book and I'll be like, this could be in sociology. This could be in history. I'm not really sure where I'm going to find it. Uh, a book I just picked up the other day from um, Gray Matter when we went for their sale 
was this book called called On Killing, and it was kind of uh, it's like essays about war and what's the point, and is, is there anything as you know anything supposedly is it just war and you know where do you find that book exactly? Right. Is that in military history? Is that in and it's it was in the children's section? Yeah, it, it was written by uh, I think a general in Vietnam. So is it in the Vietnam section? And so I had no idea. Right. And I just happened to be like walking by a shelf, and it just like I my brain subconsciously just saw the spine. I was like, oh my god, here it is. Right. And I'm not actually I'm not even sure. It might have been like General War. Like the, yeah. the store had like a General War section. It was very small. So, uh, yeah, I, I need to do a better job of like organizing the categories when I when I look for books. But just like you said, I'm not opposed to just um, seeing something catch my eye, yeah. pull it off the shelf, read the first page, or read the back, or yeah. do you know do a quick like ask Chat GPT, yeah. um, which I've talked about before. Yeah, I, I like what you said about you know trying to be intentional about. Um, putting together your library because I feel like that's something that I've tried to do in the recent years, um, well, last year or so, gone from just like hoarding books because I saw it on a list or, you know, heard someone talk about it and yada, yada, yada. It's like, oh, this book I have to have or whatever. Um, I've heard of this author, so I have to have it, things like that. And I've really tried to transition to more um, curation over hoarding and yes curation is a good way to put it i think you know i've definitely fallen on the trap where like i'll go on to a books or something like that when i'm have a few minutes at work and i'm bored and next thing i know i have too many books in my cart and it's hard to wean it down and things like that but i think i've tried to be a little bit more intentional about what i'm bringing in um just so that it's it's stuff that you know i i want to read yeah, and look, there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's your life. It's your money. Do do whatever you want. But I do think that it it helps to have that distinction of like, I'm collecting books. And if you're collecting books, make an actual collection. Right. Collect a type of book. Whether you like you said, maybe it's a certain publisher. Our friend Gunner, who's been in a couple of my my short form videos, uh, he collects books from this publishing company called Progress Publishers. They were a huge publisher in the Soviet Union during the Cold War era, and they had, like, communist sympathizer presses here in the States that would print English versions of their books, and so he collects those. And that's cool, you know? It's like he's never going to read all of them. They're about wacky stuff. Like, you know, the the economic situation of 1950s Russia. Like, you know, he's not going to read that necessarily, but um, it's just cool to to have a collection like that. And And I do think... That is kind of important too, because some of these presses will go out of business. Like that, that Progress Publishers doesn't exist anymore. Right. So it will be cool to have somebody who's preserved that in history, um, and just have it there as as a record. You know. So, and then you know, if, if you're gonna not collect a specific type of book, then just buy books that you have the intention of reading. Uh, and when you when you have that in mind, you'll find you're probably going to buy less books because you really start to discern like, yeah, you know, this looks interesting, but if I'm being honest with myself, I'm not going to read, I'm not going to read. Right. So, all right, let's move on to the next question. Um, This is from waste mailing list on Instagram. Our friend Seth, uh, who's great. If you don't follow him, you should. He says books you've come to love over time after not liking them at first or vice versa. Why don't you go first on this one? Ooh. That's a toughie. Or if you need a minute, I can go first. Go first. I'm going to flip through my list. So I think a book that I I actually did really like it at first, but I look at it with greater fondness now is Shogun Mm. by James Clavell. You and I read that about the same time. Uh, I think it was the first book that you and I both read in 2022. We we started the year with a a 1,100 page book together. I had COVID when I read it. Is I that was, what it was? Yeah, I was just in quarantine, and I was like, "All right, yeah, perfect time to dive in." So I, I liked it. I liked it a lot, actually. But since then, you know, it, when you, if you'd asked me right when I finished it, I'm like, "Yeah, it was good." Since then, I haven't read anything that's given me like the same feeling. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I've, I've read other books that have given me great, 
great experiences and great feelings, but just not that same like epic, intricate, complicated uh, plot storyline. I just, nothing's really hit that mark. And I haven't been reading a ton of books that would maybe compare to that. I was hoping kind of like the long ships Mm -hmm. would do that, but it just didn't scratch that itch. Um, I think for me personally, you know, we've talked about this before, or or you and I talked about this when I was, um, when I had started the long ships, you know, those types of books where it's like just a straight narrative. Um, not that Shogun's really just like A to B, but it's linear at least in how, you know, there's inner yes. intertwining, um, plot lines and all that, but it's, it's pretty linear narrative. Um, it's well written, but there's not like, it's this like super elevated, um, really exuberant prose, you know, books like that don't typically grab my attention. Yeah. And, you know, maybe it's because, like I said, I had COVID and I reading anything harder than that wouldn't have gone well for me. Mm. Um, but that's one of the few like adventure books for lack of a better term, you know, things with like a, a just straight narrative that like really captivated me. Yeah. Like, you know, I was just, binging that hard and it was like you said like i look back on it fondly yeah um and, and there's a show that, coming out i know on I'm fx which, yeah i think it's in february yeah which i'm excited i'm about. really excited about that another book that uh i think i liked not a, I, I didn't dislike but i was kind of like lukewarm on through most of it was a hundred years of solitude mm. and then immediately upon starting another read I was like, what is this? Like writing for children? You know, it just seems right. so like boring. Yeah. Uh, it was, oh, it was, uh, I read The Pale Blue Eye right after 100 mm. Years of Solitude, which was a fun little story, but it just, the writing just could not compare. And I, when I was reading 100 Years of Solitude, you know, there's so many characters and they're all named the same. And you're like, what the hell's going on? Uh, but immediately afterwards, I was like kind of longing for that intricacy again, I guess. So that's I think those are the two books that come to mind. I can't think of anything that I liked at the time and like looking back I'm like, "Eh, maybe that wasn't as good." This sounds a little sacrilegious, but maybe of Mice of, of Mice and Men by mm-hmm. Steinbeck. It's probably his like most famous work and it's good. Yeah. But I don't like feel the need to like talk about it or reread it or eh, it's whatever. Yeah. I don't think I have any that I I liked while I was reading it or, you know, liked upon finishing it that I have grown to dislike, grown to dislike. I have a handful of books that I disliked while I was reading them or, or was not super into it while I was reading it. Um, and either I pushed through stupidly or I, I, um, decided to call it and put that book back on the shelf. I have a few books like that that, excuse me, I've grown to dislike more, Yeah, you know, but I don't think I have, excuse me, geez, anything that I've like flipped my opinion on right. upon finishing and just like over time. Um, I don't have a ton of books that I I've, have finished and, grown in appreciation for like really liked more yeah um flipping through my red list um on goodreads i think one of the one of the few that really sticks out is um crying of lot 49 Mm. by pension you like it more or less more okay you know it's it's uh, obviously it's a pretty short book i think my copy is like 150 pages Mm -hmm. um you could, if you really had nothing going on, you could really easily read it in a day. Um, it might be a long day. It's not like it's yeah. quick, easy reading. You're sure. going to bang it out in an hour. But, um, And I think it's a book of pensions that gets discussed a lot at the academic level. You know, there's a lot of like... Was it his first novel? Second. What was his first? V. Okay. Um, You know, because it's just short and... Um, much more accessible book 
it, it, it's used a lot in like academic settings and things like that. That makes sense. Um, there's plenty of discussion out there on it, but I think he he packs so much um, into such a short book, and you can really dissect it. Yeah. Um, and because it's more accessible than something like Gravity's Rainbow, it's it's a little bit easier to I don't want to say easier to understand, but it's easier to start that dissection of. There, there is a it, it, for me. There is a subconscious thing when I can feel in my right hand how many pages are left right. while I'm reading. It can be tough when you're pushing through something that's difficult, mm-hmm. and you just feel this massive lump in your right hand. Right, you just think, "Oh God, this is going to take me forever." Right. So when you're reading something that's more difficult, if it's shorter, I think it is easier to kind of persevere. Yeah. But you know, within it, he he really starts to set the foundation for some of the bigger ideas that he explores in Gravity's Rainbow and and throughout his uh, work in general. But I think it's it's one that I I think about a lot just because of how you can kind of use that book to start understanding his work. So even though I really liked it, um, even though it wasn't my favorite of his works, I think it's one that I think about more often than some of the others just mm. because of the way, like like I said, it's accessible, it's a little bit more digestible, and you can kind of begin the track of thinking about some of his bigger ideas. Yeah. So um, I don't think I have... Any others off the top of my head? Yeah, it's a good question. It's an interesting question, but I don't think my list for that is too long. I think typically if I didn't like something, I stay not liking it. And if I did like it, I stay liking it. Right. Um, I'm sure there's some books from my childhood that if I reread as an adult, I'd be like, wow, you were an idiot. But um, Oh, look at this. Here's one. Okay. Um, I don't have a ton to say about this book, but apparently when I first read um, Blood Meridian three years ago now, um, I only gave it three stars on Goodreads. Oh man, the Cormac McCarthy fans Which, are going to come for you. I know, and I that's blasphemous. I have told a couple people like when I read that, I did not have the appreciation and um, taste for difficult works of fiction mm. that I I have now. So I think that was one of those like I struggled with this book not good right you know which isn't fair um yes it's something that i i I did the same thing with gravity's rainbow when i first read it i was like i didn't really like i understand a lot of this book four stars you know i still read it it's still a good rating Mm -hmm. but like i wouldn't say that about it now i think if i read reread blood meridian which i would like to in the near future um i might not turn around and be like this is my favorite book ever but I would, I would certainly probably rate it a little bit higher and understand it in the the context of the greater um, literary canon. I've really tried to get away from saying books are good or not good. Absolutely, because so much of a book is personal preference. When the book hits you, when when, when where you are in life when you read it, and which is difficult when you're making book reviews, which is right. a lot of the content I put out. So I've really just been trying to explain kind of what the book is about, who might enjoy it. Right. I might throw in whether I liked it or not. And if I didn't like it, I might downplay that a little bit uh, because what I think of a book really shouldn't matter too much right. to the viewer. If you're someone that knows me personally, that's a different story. Or if you've been following my content for a while, that might be a little bit different because you're starting to get a sense of what I like and what I don't like. And you might be able to identify whether or not we're similar in our reading tastes, right. but I don't want someone who's just randomly flipping through and like sees a video of mine for the first time. They're like, Oh, I'm not going to, I was going to read this, but this guy says it's not good. And he's got 15,000 followers on TikTok. Like, right. It's, it's just, it feels a little gross to me. I mean, I said this when we sat down with um, Dan Lawton, mm-hmm. I, I don't like giving bad reviews because I'm just a guy with an Instagram account. Like right. I'm not like a qualified reviewer i don't have years of experience 
Right. You're um, not a you're not a trained critic. No, I'm, yeah. I'm not a critic by any means. You yeah. know, I I think if you asked me what I like about a book, I would be able to articulate that much better than what I didn't like about a book. Yeah, and, I and mean, it, it's like you said. Like sometimes it just comes down to um, personal preference. Like yeah. I said at the, the top of the show, like I didn't really care for the Grapes of Wrath. I'm not going to sit here and critique John Steinbeck. <laughs> right. Like right. that would be foolish of me. Right. I just didn't connect with it. Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and say it's a bad book. Right. Yeah. It, just, it, it didn't, you know. There's a flip side to it, though. I think that sometimes people rate difficult books and highly regarded books higher than they deserve because they've they've put in the work to read it and they don't want to say like it wasn't that good. Right. And I haven't read blood Meridian. So I'm not saying that's the case with that, but sometimes I get that vibe. Like people are like, Oh, you know, you have to read blood Meridian. It's McCarthy's like best book. And I'm like, I mean, I've heard a lot of people say they read it and had no, no idea what was going on. Yeah. Like, so you got to take it for what it is. I mean, and that's, that's probably why I gave it three stars at the time is because I didn't understand it. I didn't know what was going on. Right. And I'm not saying that I'm, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a five star book either, right? You know? you know, I'm I'm a much smarter and more attentive reader than I was three years ago. I'm not saying if I picked up Blood Meridian tomorrow, I would perfectly understand it. I would still struggle a lot. I'm sure of it. Yeah, you'd probably get more out of it though. But I would get more out of it, and I might have a more um, fine tuned rating. Yeah, it's also this is a totally different discussion but like it's also part of why i don't like the goodreads rating system well i i rate books on goodreads more for myself yeah than anybody else. i don't right you know same thing i don't want people to see it and be like oh this guy gave it three stars it's just for me it's a catalog of my sentiment at the time yeah and you know there are sometimes where i feel like it'd be i'd be better off like leaving an actual review yeah than just giving it x number of stars right but then there are other books where i finish them and i'm like I don't really feel the need to write anything about. You don't this. have anything to say. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It was okay, but I don't. Yeah, I don't have anything to say. All right, let's move on to the next question. This one comes from Foamy Lomi on Foamy Instagram, Lomi. which is a great, great name. Uh, how do you maintain reading stamina? I'm struggling to stay focused. Uh, I'll I'll start on this one first, and this is not necessarily what's happening here, but. I got a comment on a video about how to stay focused the other day. Someone was like, how do you stay focused? I just, I just don't know. And I'm like, you're literally commenting on a video that has five suggestions. Maybe just try one of those. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if you had said, I, I tried these. They didn't work. Do you have any other tips? That'd be different. But they're just, I'm like, did you watch the video that you're commenting on? Um, but this came in through uh, an Instagram story with the with the uh -huh. sticker to ask questions. So we, Foamy Lomi is not in that category of uh, um, not paying attention to what the, the content of the video is. Um, so for me, the number one thing is just, well, not the number one thing, but a huge part of staying focused is removing distractions mm. and I have notifications turned off on my phone. The only thing that will make this thing make a noise is a phone call. Mm -hmm. uh, and because no one likes to be on the phone anymore, that rarely happens. Uh, particularly, I mean, I use this for work. So during the day I get phone calls, but like when I sit down at night at seven o'clock at night, no one's calling me. Right. So that's the big thing is removing distractions. And I think just, I, I talk about this all the time, just committing to reading at least one page every single day, no matter what. Yeah. If you're at the end of your day, you've had a hellish day, you're exhausted, you have all kinds of stress in your life, you just want to crawl in bed and go to sleep or turn on Netflix or whatever, just pick up a book and read at least one page. And the reason that works so well is you typically won't just stop at one page. You go, okay, I'm in the groove now after one page, so let me read a few more, and then you'll read 10 or 15 or whatever. But also it just maintains the skill of reading because right. reading is a skill. If you, It's not natural. You have to be taught how to do it, and you have to practice at it. And so if you go a long period of time without reading, those reading muscles, for lack of a better term, are just going to be out of shape. So you just have to do it daily, in my opinion. 
What are your tips for reading stamina? Yeah, I mean, I would echo the same thing. Try to read every day. Um, said it earlier. It's one of the reasons why I typically will read um, more than one book at a time. Yeah. I, you know, it's a mix between that and my short attention span. Um, you know, if I'm... Um, if if I have a long day at work and I'm reading this book that's, you know, Gravity's Rainbow, for instance, or any book that's difficult mm -hmm. to follow, difficult to read, I've had a long day at work, I'm either not going to want to read that or will only get a couple pages in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe I read those couple pages and that keeps my, my habit going, but maybe, you know, that's that's you're someone that that's not enough to satisfy right excuse me if you have an easier book going and you know it's something you can read 20 pages of yeah get a chapter in you're keeping up that habit you don't have to sit and read for an hour you know um just even 10 minutes a day yeah it's you can read more than you think and uh, not to interrupt you, Andy, but one thing that really made me realize how much more reading I could be doing was I had a, a feature on my last phone. And if your phone doesn't have this feature, you can probably download an app. But it just shows you how often you use your phone uh -huh. and which apps you use, how long you use them. And so every week I would get a report, total phone usage. And it would, could be a little deceiving because it would count any usage. So if I'm driving four hours somewhere and using Google Maps, it's tracking that. But, right. you know, you can obviously know. Um, but it would be like, hey, dude, you spent eight hours cumulatively on Reddit. Right. On one freaking app. Yeah. And you're just like, and, you know, the next one was Instagram. You spent six hours on that. And it's like, wow. You yeah. know, and, of course, a lot of that's like. You're standing in line at the grocery store and you scroll Reddit for three minutes. And so right. it's fragmented, but still overall makes you realize that like I'm spending way too much time and I could uh, siphon off some of that into reading time instead. Yeah. I I've been surprised. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I think the more I've been reading, I think I've been getting a little bit quicker, you know, I, I can read a little bit faster, but I'm often surprised at um, how much I'm able to read in a, a relatively short amount of time, mm. you know, um, again, this depends on the book, but sometimes, you know, I, I've gotten in the habit lately of like reading on my lunch break at work and I, I only have 30 minutes, mm -hmm. but like, I'll, I'll go sit out in my car and set a timer for 30 minutes. So I know like, all right, time to go back to work. But like this guy is reading on his lunch break. That's commitment folks. And, and you know, part of that is, me really enjoying reading. I'm not yeah. saying that is a good starting point for someone that's trying to get into it. Yeah. Um, Cause some people, you know, like to just stare at their phone and disassociate on their lunch. Sure. Break, which yeah. Do that. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll set that timer and I'll finish a chapter or, you know, get 20 pages in or whatever. I'm like, okay, that was probably most of my time. Like maybe I should just, close it here and and I'll check and I'll still have like 15 minutes left or whatever. I'm like, oh, wow. I, you know, I, I think, um, I think if you go into it with the idea that you have to dedicate an hour, two hours, whatever extended period of time you want to assign to it to get a good amount of reading in every day, you're probably going to, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure Mm. Um, you know, like you said, take 10 minutes. It's, it's anyone can take 10 minutes. Right. And if you can't find 10 minutes in your day, you have some bigger problems to deal with. We can't help you on this podcast. And I don't mean that as like a, um, yeah, it falls out of our scope. Of yeah. That. I don't mean that as like an insult <laughs> towards anyone that can't find. Right. Cause there's probably some yeah. single mother with four kids. Absolutely. Who legitimately can't find right. 10 minutes out of her day. Right. Um, I have no suggestions for you. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish I did. But, you know, if if you, I think most people with the goal in mind of reading more um, can probably find time. One thing that also helped me a lot 
really get into this habit of regular reading. Um, I didn't set out with the goal of I want to read more. My goal was I want to be a reader. Yeah. Like I want to be the type of person that reads a lot. And, you know, that made it much, much more easier for me um, to kind of try to figure out how to make time, when to make time, things like that. Because, you know, if you haven't read a book since high school and your goal is to read more, if you read one book in a year, you have read more. Which, and again, I don't mean that as a criticism. Right. You, it's great. I'm happy for you. You accomplish your goal. But if your goal is to be well read or read a lot of books, you're going to have to read one, more than one. Right. So I think kind of making that more of an identity thing than an action helped me a lot. Yeah. And not to get too far off topic, but this does play a part. And that's, I, I'm very outspoken against reading goals in terms of number of books. Mm. And I know that you, you're you shooting for 100, but that was kind of like, a, oh, wow, I've read 80. Right. Let, that, me, let that, me just push. Right. That became a thing once I hit 75. Yeah. You know, I I said this to someone the other day. I, I set my reading challenge on Goodreads for one book, mostly because I wanted to use the annual tracking feature. Right which you can't do if you don't have a reading challenge goal. Right, right. Like you can obviously keep track of what you've read, but it won't do the... The recap. The the recap or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I... I've talked about it. Like I've obviously really gotten into a lot of short books this year. Yeah. Um, and I think I hit that point, you know, when I was still working at the gym, I, I had, I could really dedicate like hours a day yeah. to reading and I just can't do that at my new job. So I got to a point where I was like, it it feels, it felt good to get that little like dopamine hit of finishing a book. And then I, you know, saw the numbers go up and like I said, I, you know, I hit like 75 and I was like, I could realistically like read a hundred books, but that hasn't been my goal. Right. And the problem it's, it's counterintuitive, but I think it's actually detrimental to people's reading habits. And, we all know somebody that's like, I read 50 and then I set my goal as 75 and then I set my goal as 100 and my goal next year is 150. And it's like, great, cool, good for you. But there's nothing more detrimental to a goal than feeling like you're not going to hit it. Right. And then you just abandon it. So there's going to be people out there that are like, I want to read 50 books, basically one a week. And they get halfway through the year and they've read 10. They're like, eh. I'm not going to make it. Who cares? Whatever. Right. I'll just abandon the goal. You you only ever hear about the success stories. Like if you go on Facebook groups or Reddit or, or on Instagram, you're only hearing from the people that set the goal of 100 and hit it. You're not hearing from people that set the goal of you know 100 and read 20 because they're not even participating in conversations anymore because right. they're just like, ah, whatever. Maybe reading is not for me or maybe I'm not the reader I thought I was. And then when you start out with these, first of all, there's a – a kind of cutoff of like the return on investment, right? Like is reading 20 books better than reading two? Yes. Like objectively. Yes. But like, is reading a hundred books better than reading 50? Like, I, I, I don't know. Right. Probably not. Um, and so every year, if you're trying to outdo yourself and continually progress for lack of a better term, cause it's not really progress in my opinion, you then are going to make very different choices about the stuff you read. Maybe you read stuff that's easier because it's faster or shorter because you can right. rack up the book count. You know, are you going to be a more well-read person if you read 10,000 page books or a hundred, you know, hundred page books? Like, right. I, I don't know. I, right. It's, it's, it depends how you define, want to define well-read. And yeah. Like that. And I think, you know, I'm glad you just brought that up about like picking easier or shorter books. Um, I think, you know, like, like I said, once I got to around 75, um, was then I was like, oh, I could maybe actually hit 100. That'd be pretty cool. And then I think it was somewhere where I was like maybe sitting in the low 80s where I had picked up um, this short book that was like a hundred something pages. Um, 
and I don't know, I was maybe a third of the way through or whatever, and I wasn't really into it. I wasn't really feeling it, and I kept trying to like push, and I ended up calling it quits, um, and I had probably a couple of weeks there where I was like, am I just picking books to try and get to that 100 number now? Right. And it, it um, I, I had to stop and think, like, maybe I'm just going to scrap this goal. Like right, it, it was a fun idea for a few weeks there, but yeah, like, but you recognize how arbitrary it is, right? Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm sitting at um, 96 right now. I have I'm pretty confident in my ability to finish four books in the next six or seven weeks. Yeah. But at the same time, like, if I don't hit do that, like, I don't care. I've I've just read right. a lot of great books, and I don't whatever. So if you make your goal to be a reader or to read every day or however you want to kind of frame that concept, let's say tomorrow I don't read at all. Two weeks from now, I'm not going to look back on that on, on tomorrow and go, oh, you know what? I didn't read last Monday or two Mondays ago, so I'm just going to give up on this goal. Right. No, you can be like, my goal is to read every day. It's you know a new day. I can still hit that goal today. Right. But again, if you set your goal for 50 books and by the end of the year and it's, you've read 10, you're going to be like, eh, whatever. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's the very, very long winded answer on how to <laughs> improve your reading stamina. Um, let's move on to the next question. We have some great questions here. Uh, this kind of plays into a similar vein. Um, Artist in Denial on TikTok asks, advice for beginner readers who read slowly on how to quicken their pace and still retain the content of the book. So don't try to quicken your pace. Just keep reading and over time you will become a faster reader. Yeah, um, I'm not a fast reader. I'm probably maybe even a little bit below average in speed uh, for whatever reason. I, I think that retaining what you read and the speed at which you read aren't necessarily directly connected. I find the best way to retain what you read is to really take your time with the work, but also like really think about what you're reading, have discussions right. with people about it, write your own review just because once you put pen to paper, it's going to help you remember that stuff. Just being more involved with what you're reading. There's a great video by, um, the co-host of uh, Catfished mm -hmm. on MTV. Um, what's the? Do you know the guy's name? No. He's like uh, he's not the main dude, but he's he's got like the grayish hair. Um, he has a YouTube channel. It's not specifically about books, but he has this one video that's extremely well done, and it's about him trying to become more well-read, and he kind of realizes like, oh. I, like haven't really read much, a kind right. of an idiot, you know? And so he goes on this quest on like how to improve his reading and read more. And, and he talks to a guy who's like, I think has like the world record for like fastest reader in the world. And he gets hired by like politicians mm -hmm. when they get handed, you know, huge bills with thousands of pages and they have to make decisions about it like the next day. Like right. this dude like speed reads it to like give them a synopsis or whatever. Okay. Uh, and so he I hate our government. Yeah, exactly. Um, so he's like coaching him on how to read faster and he gives him all these tips. But then at the end of the video, he's like, but you know what? Like, don't even, don't even do it. Like, right. don't even do what I'm telling you to do. He's like, at the end of the day, I don't even like to read like this for fun. Right. He goes, I'll just like pick up a book and, and read in, in my, my normal way. And, and so I think, there's a lot of debate about um, speed techniques and it's like some people actually are saying every word in their head and some people are just kind of like looking at groups looking of at words yeah. and, and processing it. I guess you're not supposed to read in your head. That's how I do it though. So whatever. I enjoy my time. I read a good amount of books. Um, the only thing I find that really quickens my pace in a really tangible way is and I'll do this if I'm getting a little tired is I'll just take my finger and yeah. underline with my finger what I'm reading. Do that or use a bookmark. Or use the a same bookmark. thing. Um, but yeah, I would, I think what you said was, was a perfect answer. Just don't worry about the speed and just do what you got to do. I think sometimes like I, 
have to like force myself to try and slow down. So I, I think if you're, you know, reading at a level that you feel comfortable with, I mean, if you're, you know, really struggling and it's like taking you, you know, 20 minutes to read one page or something like that, we might not be the people that, right. to answer. But like if you're, you know, reading at a good sufficient pace and you feel like you're understanding what you're reading, then don't try to force what you're reading. Mm. I think just focus on reading and, um, you know, over time you'll probably become a faster reader. Yeah. Uh, all right. So artist in denial on TikTok had a, a couple of really good questions. Uh, super fan. Yeah. Why would you place books above other forms or mediums? That is, if you eat, if you even place them above other forms in the first place, Ooh, that's a good question. Great question. And just to uh, preface this, uh, I, if you have some type of situation or disability that prevents you from reading this is not a knock on your preferred medium this gets talked about when i when i talk about audiobooks a lot people are, oh you're ableist it's like no i'm not ableist if you enjoy audiobooks and that's the way you have to read or you enjoy reading that's awesome keep doing that There's uh-huh. nothing wrong with that um for me i think that books hold a few distinct advantages number one you really do have to pay more attention when you're reading than other things. You can listen to music quite passively. You can even watch television or movies quite passively. Mm -hmm. You can't really read passively. So there's that. Uh, Number two books, I think take a greater effort for the individual to create. Mm. And I think that really comes across in the work. Uh, I talked about this a little bit in some other content, but obviously We'll use like Hollywood as an example. There's there's a huge these are huge projects. They're complicated projects that involve um, not only the artistry of acting and and the script process and directing, but also a huge technical knowledge for the lighting and the audio and the editing and the whole thing. And these are projects that are sometimes in the hundreds of millions of dollars as far as budgets are concerned. Unbelievable pieces of artwork. But those are very big, big group efforts. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of people with their hands in the cookie jar and a lot of people putting their influence on it. And, you know, if you took one actor out and replace it with another, that could totally change the dynamic. And the director has his vision and the producer has their vision and their say because they're paying for it. And the actor has his way or her way of doing things. And so there's a lot of uh different ideas coming together where like books yeah there's an editor and there's a maybe a publisher that's going to have some influence but generally speaking books are like the true vision of one person right and i think that makes a big difference um and i just for whatever reason like the the way written word works i just think is so much more detailed than other forms of of communication and going back to visual media, right? Like everyone always says the the books, the books better than the movie. That's usually the sentiment and, Oh, they cut this out. They cut that out of the movie. Well, you can spend the time, you know, if you want to write a 500 page book, you can write a 500 page book. If you want to make a four hour movie, you might have a hard time getting people to bankroll that. Right. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I think I agree pretty much with everything you said. I think, for me, a lot of it is just like it's that it's a more personal level of engagement. Yes. You know, um, people can certainly um, have differing opinions on a film or a TV show or a, a piece of visual art. Um, but I think the the just personal level of engagement an experience you have while reading a book is so much more intense than, you know, something you might feel um, with a TV show or something like that. And I think for me, part of it too is like, it's just this quiet time 
alone with myself and the book and the thoughts that that reading generates. Yes. There's no... It's meditative in a way. It's meditative, exactly. There's no um, external stimulus, Mm -hmm. you know? It's it's me and the the words on the page. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm certainly not immune to being moved by a good TV show or movie or something like that. But I just think the the experience of the emotions is is so much greater when reading than those other any other medium. So, uh, yeah. So we're good. we have we have a bunch more questions. Not all of them are book related. I did say you could ask us about anything. <laughs> Someone, uh, Christina on TikTok asked, "What's my favorite day of the year?" Um, I don't know. I'm not sure that I have one. Whatever day Gibson's is having a yeah, book sale, twenty five percent off. Um, uh, Artists in denial. Uh, books that impacted you the most. That's a that's a. A long list. There's a lot of books that have impacted me a lot. I think the one book that really fundamentally started to change the way I think about America and being an American is probably in the spirit of Crazy Horse by Peter Mathiason. Mm. It's about um, the FBI's involvement with the American Indian movement, which is what the kind of body uh, fighting for indigenous rights used to be called. Um, And essentially, if you're not familiar with it, the reservations are are supposed to have a certain degree of autonomy and serenity. Um, And there were FBI agents going on to reservations and kind of overstepping and really just in my opinion, like looking to stir uh, just for no other reason other than like racism. And right. um, J. Edgar Hoover's was a huge piece. Of uh, <laughs> but um, an FBI agent ended up getting shot and killed on a reservation. And Leonard Peltier uh, basically was arrested, tried and convicted for that crime, even though the evidence doesn't really support that he was the one to do it. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously, anytime anyone's killed, that's not great. But there also could be the argument that, like, I, 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 I can't say he deserved it, but like, the situation was a doing of the FBI's own right uh, own making. So, um, when you read that book and you start to kind of see like the insane amount of money and resources that the U S government pours into just making the lives of like already downtrodden people worse. You're just like, what the f- yeah. are we doing guys? Yeah. Uh, so that, that book had a really big, and not that I was a super like patriotic person to begin with, but after that, reading that, I was just like, man, I can't really get behind a lot of what we're doing. Uh, on the governmental level, you know, I think sometimes people hear a critique like that and they they think it's anti-American, but it's like, you know, governments are not their citizens necessarily. Right. So um, there's a lot of great things about America and its citizens, but uh, that's just not one of them. No. <laughs> so no. anyway, what book impacted you, hopefully in a positive way? Uh, <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know. I feel this is going to sound kind of redundant. I mean, I've just talked about Gravity's Rainbow, kind of the um, Infinite Jest, some of the big three, I think. Um, Wait, what's the third one? I mean, I was going to, I guess you could say like a Ben of Securities up there in my top three. Oh, oh like your big three. Yeah. Gotcha. I, gotcha. I, I don't know. You being, you know, kind of amb- ambiguous, ambiguous. What the fuck? Ambiguous? Yes, there we go. Ambiguous. <laughs> Words are hard. <laughs> it's been a long couple of weeks, man. Ambiguous. Um, you know, you can kind of insert your like, you know, the the um quote unquote lit bro like meme trilogy is your your gravity's rainbows, your infinite jests, Ulysses, okay, Moby that's, Dick. That's what like I that. thought you were referring to. Yeah, like lit bro trilogy. Yeah, okay. like you're kind of your classic like lit bro stuff. Yeah. Um, 
but the, there have been plenty of books. I, I think most of the books that have had um, a really great impact on me, like we've talked about at length on the show, um, the, the two I already mentioned, three I've already mentioned, uh, Naked Singularity, Warlock, yeah, Hundred Years of Solitude. Go like, listen to our old episodes. Is basically what Andy's saying. <laughs> Go listen to our entire catalog. It's you know, only like 10, not nine, even nine episodes. I think we're at like, this is, I think this is eight. Like yeah, every time I upload them, there's a spot to like put in what number episode it is. And I like just pick a random number. Yeah. Cause I don't even know. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's seven. It's like there was already a seven. I was like, okay, this is episode, uh, number F. <laughs> like we're just, do, do people, does it, does it need to be broken down in seasons? Cause it asked me too. It's like, what season is this? Yeah, I, like, I, I don't guess know. It's one. I did yes. a podcast on this channel two, three years ago. Right. So, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think, I don't know if I have any that have impacted me to the point of like drastically changing who I am as a person. Yeah. I think there are a number of books that have really impacted, um, who I am as a reader. I think you mentioned hundred years of solitude to me before. Yeah. That might be one of the few works of fiction that have really like maybe impacted myself it impacted me as a person. Yeah. But I think mostly it's, it's stuff that's like affected who I am as a reader. And and like you said, I, basically you can listen to any of our other previous episodes and I'll wax poetically about those. Yeah. You know, um, I don't, I don't know if I have any, anything to add. Sure. Um, All right. So, well, um, we, we do have more questions, but we're already an hour in. So uh, <laughs> what was meant to be like a 20, 30-minute uh, introduction, we're, we're going to have to wait. Thank you to everyone for the questions. We'll get and, to uh, more of 